At this time, we'll have the uh, reading of the, the text today, which is found in 1 Kings. So if you turn in your Bibles there, we actually there are, there are three readings. Uh, two of them are short, and then one of them is a little bit longer. Um, although the text will be 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 41 and following. But the first uh, reading in 1 Kings will be chapter 17. So if you turn back there. It'll be, this one will consist of just one verse. Let us now hear the word of God. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. And then if you turn to chapter 18, chapter 18, verse 1. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the earth. And then a little bit of verse 2. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab, and there was a severe famine in Samaria. And then we have the reading of the text found in 1 Kings chapter 18, or yes, uh, chapter 18. And here I'm going to begin reading at verse 41. Verse 41, then Elijah said to Ahab, go up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of abundance of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel. Then he bowed down on the ground and put his face between his knees and said to his servant, go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, there is nothing. And seven times he said, go again. And it came to pass the seventh time that he said, there is a cloud as small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. So he said, go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Now it happened in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds and wind and there was a heavy rain. So Ahab rode away and went to Jezreel. Then the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. And may God the Holy Spirit see fit to bless the reading of his word here in this section of scripture. As uh, today, congregation, we will consider the theme, God sovereignly answers Elijah's prayer for covenant rain. Now in order to understand the ministry of Elijah, we have to understand what God expected him to do. In fact, what God expected his prophets, all of his prophets to do. God saddled his prophets with two cardinal responsibilities. First, they were foretellers and forthtellers. They were inspired forthtellers that is, teachers, and they were inspired foretellers, that is, prophets of things to come. And second, we, may miss, we, also, we might miss that prophets not only majored in prophesying, but they also majored in prayer. In fact, the Christian ministry itself is a ministry of the word of God and of prayer, we're told in Acts chapter 6. And I remind you, these are not two separate compartments, but each is vital to one another, as the word of God must be administered prayerfully, and just as your prayers need to be word of God-centered. For example, Samuel was a prophet, was he not? And we find Samuel praying, Far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and right way. So there we have the prayer 
the praying, and then we also have the teaching in that one verse in 1 Samuel 12, verse 23. So when we meet up with Elijah the prophet, we find uh, the same resume. Elijah prophesied and Elijah prayed. He prayed fervently. He prayed diligently. As, it, uh, as James tells us in his letter in chapter 5, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now, fervent, diligent prayer isn't appreciated. It is not cherished by name-only nominal Christians who pray for many false reasons. One is just simply to soothe their conscience because they're guilty, feel guilty, they haven't prayed at all. Or someone who prays a quickie prayer to get what he wants, as if God is no more than a slot machine, where you invest the money of prayer, and then you get an immediate big payoff. The very thought of diligent, fervent, persevering prayer, in fact, by some people, is considered to be madness, fanaticism. Why do, why do they say that? Because they think of God as a busboy, as a bellhop, one who is always available when you snap your fingers to carry your bags. Some of our founding fathers were anti-Christians, like Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin, despite being raised in a Christian home, his uh, parents were members of Cotton Mather's church, believe it or not. But Benjamin Franklin, even from his younger years, was a scoffer. A very early sign of his unbelief in prayer is um, when he was in school as a, a, young, a young man and um, more of an elementary school. And uh, his teacher said, was teaching one day on the Bible, and she said that Jesus said, ask and you shall receive. So Benjamin Franklin took that literally, and he started praying for gingerbread. Well, it just so happened that his teacher had been smuggling gingerbread into the classroom for many, many days. And so when um, Franklin prayed the prayer for gingerbread, lo and behold, what happened? She reached into a drawer or a shelf and pulled out gingerbread. And as a, as, as a result of that, Benjamin Franklin was encouraged to pray more often because he received prayer and answer to his prayers immediately. So he tells us that he, uh, for three days he prayed and he prayed and he prayed and nothing came of his prayers. So finally he confided in his mother that he had ceased to be a Christian because he was, he called himself a Christian, uh, a Christian only, or a, a Christian for revenue only. That's his expression. We would call it a slot machine prayer. And later in life, when Franklin did pray, and it was often, he prayed to this abstraction, which he called goodness with a capital G, and that was it. That was his idea of God, just simply goodness. Now, true prayer diligently calls upon the name of the Lord. And this is portrayed in Elijah's ministry. Let's back up just a moment and try to understand who this prophet was. He ministered during the days of Ahab in Israel. And, of course, to understand Ahab, we must also understand Israel's history. And Israel's history was checkered maybe I should say characterized with wicked kings like Ahab. But all, of all of the monarchs of Israel in this time, there was none who was more depraved than Ahab. Ahab not only endorsed idolatry throughout Samaria, he intensified it. For example, his marriage to Jezebel was a disaster for the nation. <clears throat> Jezebel, you recall, was the daughter of the king of Sidon, who was a fervent worshiper of Baal, as Jezebel was. Baal means husband, master, lord. Baal was a Canaanite fertility god who supposedly gave rain and fertility to the land. And he was uh, trapped within, this uh, god was trapped within the cycles of seasons 
being a God who was not outside of nature, but a God who was inside of nature, within nature. In other words, you don't really have the creator-creature distinction anymore because Baal was a part of the creation. And you know, there's something very uh, similar in the El Nino phenomenon out here in California that we talk about. As El Nino means, literally, Godchild. Uh, if you've ever done the background uh, check of that expression, but it means Godchild. So when the waters warm around Christmas time, many of the meteorologists like to say that El Nino is active. In fact, to hear meteorologists talk, it's as if El Nino or warm water is, is, a, is, is a modern bale, both El Nino and bale being entrapped within nature. So to please Jezebel, Ahab made Baal worship the official worship of Israel. And not only that, in order to get his way, he had to exterminate, to silence all of the prophets, God's mouthpieces. And the great point is that Israel's God is the true and living God, so that Baal must be exposed as a false god, as an idol, as a figment of men's imaginations, a worthless, impotent, Casper milk toast type of deity. Baal can not only not uh, bring fire, he cannot bring rain either, which means that Baal, quite simply, does not exist. And rain is what Israel needed. God promised to bless his people with rain, with covenant rain. Listen to Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 10 and 12. There, the Lord says, For the land which you go to possess is not like the land of Egypt from which you have come, where you sowed your seed and watered it by foot as a vegetable garden. For the land which you cross over to possess is a land of hills and valley, which drinks water from the rain of heaven, a land for which the Lord your God cares. And the eyes of the Lord are your God are always on it from the beginning of the year to the very end of the year. And then a little bit later in that same chapter in verse 17, you're told that if Israel serves other gods and worships then, then the Lord's anger will be aroused against you and he will shut up the heavens that there be no rain and the land yield no produce and you perish quickly from the good land which the Lord is giving you. So after reading those words, <clears throat> we learn that both drought and famine are expressions of God's wrath upon Israel for their idolatry. And the rain, when it does come, is an expression of God's love for his people. Now in this sermon, <clears throat> I hope to magnify Elijah's second miracle his prayer for famine, and then his prayer for rain. Let's remember, Elijah was the John the Baptist of the Old Testament. He majored in announcing God's impending judgment upon the nation. And in his very first appearance to Ahab, he announces there will be no rain except at his own command. Again, chapter 17. Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall be no dew nor rain these years. Now notice something there. Not just no rain, but no dew either. Sometimes you can survive on dew alone, but no dew. And that's what he prayed for. Now, after th three years of drought, <clears throat> the scripture says, And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah, saying, Go present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the earth. So my text concerns Elijah's persevering prayer, <clears throat> even though you don't really find the word prayer in the text, but it's there by, uh, des descriptively. In fact, in the New Testament confirms this, God places a cons consecrated uh, 
uh, a beam of light on Elijah and his prayers in James chapter 5. The ESV translation is, the prayer of a righteous man has great power and effectiveness. And then James also says, Elijah was a man with like passions as ourselves, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And again he prayed, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. So just as Elijah, who's also prone to discouragement, just like us, discouragement and grim despair, melancholy, just as he prayed for famine and it came, he prayed for, again and that it might rain. So both the drought as well as the rain are fruits of Elijah's praying. So we know that 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 42, glorifies prayer without even using that word. Now the first thing that uh, you're to learn from this is that Elijah withdrew from the human stage to pray. In the Sermon on the Mount, Christ commanded that you, when you pray, enter your closet, and when you, have, when you have shut your door, pray to your Father which is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret shall reward you openly. How often have we read those words? How often? But not put them into practice the way that we should. In fact, Jonathan Edwards, uh, back in the 18th century, once preached a sermon, and this was the title of the message. You can guess where he's going with this. The title of the message was, The Church Hypocrite Found Deficient in the Duty of Private Prayer. The Church Hypocrite. It's very important that we find a place to pray in privacy and pour out our hearts in prayer. Remember years ago I was on my a trip to overseas and I got to the airport and had a lot of time to think about what I was, where I was going, what I was doing. It was all by myself. I was going to be a student overseas. And in the airport terminal I wanted to pray. Well, this was before cell phones. Well, I had been given a tip by a, a, a Christian minister that a very good place to pray if you're at an airport is you go into the phone booth. You take the phone off, you shut the door, you know, and you're in there and you're talking. And anybody that looks in thinks that you're conversing with somebody on another part of the city or the country or the world. Well, I was conversing with someone who is in heaven. Anymore, we don't need to do that because we have cell phones. Henry Luce, the uh, founder of Time Magazine, was a member of the Presbyterian Church in New York City. But when he would start the day off, he would go to the, to the uh, Time Magazine building and take the elevator all the way up to the top. And he made it a point, as he took the elevator ride up to the top, that there was no one in the elevator so that he could begin his day in prayer. Think only of Nathaniel under the fig tree. Now when you shut the door of your closet, you not only block out traffic, but your spirit is calm, your frenetic pace slows, and your wandering thoughts dissipate, and you begin in earnest to fixate upon your God. B.B. Warfield once said, true religious devotions grow best in seclusion and in darkness. He was writing about the piety of the Christian, about closet prayer. So this is what Elijah did pours out his heart before the Lord in prayer. When you're secluded like that, you're able to zero in upon God and his majestic greatness and his triple holiness. God becomes real, more, more real to you, because you're overwhelmed by his presence and you're no longer overwhelmed by your calamitous circumstances that you may be in. You know, going through the ringer, suffering affliction in this veil of tears. Your prayer closet becomes a veritable Bethel, the house of God, like Jacob's saying in his prayer when he was on one of his journeys, how dreadful is this place, for this is the house of God. There's such a thing as seeing the invisible. Moses himself endured as seeing him who is invisible. 
prayer, your, our prayers, are not conversation with someone who's so invisible that he's not there, but rather prayer is conversation with the invisible who is there. Hebrews chapter 11 says, but without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. He is, not only that he exists, but that he is there. Or to get, uh, to make, uh, get the Lord closer, he is here. So the bustling atmosphere of the world can be fatal to your prayers. The failure for you to shut your door means that you're not shutting enough of the world out. You've got to get alone if you would enjoy fellowship with God. As Warfield again said, seclusion and darkness. So let all of us take a warning here. Don't let the tyranny of the urgent kill your prayers. It's said that when you're that when you're dancing with an 800-pound gorilla, it's the gorilla's call to stop the dance. You have no chance. Don't put yourself in that situation. Let prayer cut in, closet prayer cut in, and let the gorilla be seated. Now, the second instruction that we receive is, is, uh, pertains to Elijah's posture in prayer. He cast himself on the ground and he places his head between his legs. Now certainly, we as believers are not to put our tail between our legs, but you are permitted to put your head between your legs and to pray hard as Elijah did. And you notice there is striking humility here. Elijah was one of the greats of the Old Testament. He stood as strong as a, a cedar of Lebanon, as a, as a redwood tree. But here we see this great man of God on his face. Why? Because he knew that the Lord was his God. The word Elijah means, literally, the Lord is my God, my God. So your prayer posture speaks tons. Let's remember that God's throne of grace is not only a throne of grace, but it's also a throne. Because God is the majestic king who sits upon it, a royal throne. Let us not take liberties with God to treat him as our equal. Let us beware of an indecent familiarity. Many years ago, a Hollywood actress said that if Jesus was here, the first thing she would do is jump up into his lap and give him a big kiss. Well, Scripture teaches that God is so great that it's that it's even condescending for him to even glance at the earth. None of us can sufficiently abase himself before our God. Now, of course, you can kneel before God when your heart doesn't kneel. God wants a kneeling heart, but he particularly wants a kneeling, or a, a kneel, both a, a kneeling heart and a kneeling knee, but especially the heart. It's been said that a good theologian Somebody who reads the Bible correctly, who studies books written by uh, some of the great authors of the Christian faith, a good theologian is first of all a neologian because that's what Christianity should do to us. That's what Christian theology should do to us. It puts us on our knees before our God, to pour out our hearts before him in prayer. In fact, one tradition in the Christian church is that the Apostle James prayed so much that uh, his knees were callous like a camel's. He was known as Mr. Camel Knees. How is it that somebody like that could pray so often? Have you ever asked? Was he a fanatic? Was he off balance in the Christian life? Was it just routine? A chore for him to go through that like a robot? No. He had such a close walk with God that he was on his knees all the time. In fact, at his own death, missionary David Livingston was found kneeling in prayer at his bedside in Zambia. Let's remember that what makes the Christian great, what makes you great, is when you know your place and you know that your place is before your God. 
And this is certainly what made the Puritans so great. The historian Thomas Macaulay wrote about the Puritan. This is what he said. He humbled himself in the dust before his maker, and then he placed his feet upon the neck of the king. You see, by, through prayer, the Puritan was equipped to confront kings, to preach gospel truth to these kings, so, because he humbled himself in the dust before his maker. There's an old adage, it's very true, very simple too, and that is, the way up is the way down. In fact, Puritan theology puts you, as I say, on your knees. If you, read, if you read theology and it puts you on a pedestal, it makes you proud and arrogant, then that theology is too scholastic. You're not reading it correctly, or it's been written in a scholastic way, which is too bad. Now notice this. Elijah's prayer also focused upon the living God. In that chapter 17 verse, these words, I repeat, as the Lord, the, the God of Israel, lives whom I serve, there will be neither be dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. One reason why God is called the living God is because he's contrasted with the dead idols that people worship. Most people pray to an image coined in the mint of their own minds and their own hearts, an idol. That was Benjamin Franklin's problem. When he did pray, he prayed to this thing called goodness, which was an abstraction. That is, his own idea of goodness or some other false god. Many years ago, uh, John MacArthur wrote an article, and the name of the article was Criminal Conceptions of God. What a title that is. And he exposed those who say, well, my idea of God is this. My notion of God is this. Criminal conceptions. People that say things like that ad infinitum. Infinite well, scripture teaches that God is not a concept, much less an abstraction. The true God is the person, the living God. John Calvin writes that the human heart is a factory of idolatry. And so, of course, the unbeliever is going to say, well, this is what I think God is like, or this is what I imagine God to be. When you're witnessing to them, he'll say that. Because those gods are come from the mint of his own mind, which has fallen. Well, Elijah's prayer was anchored to a divine promise. And what was that promise? God promised that it was going to rain. In chapter 18, verse 1 again, go present yourself to Ahab and I will send the rain on the earth. Every time rain appears in the Bible, God identifies himself as the rainmaker. Every time. God wants his due for every raindrop. He wants all of the glory. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus teaches that God makes his rain shine or fall upon the just and the unjust, his reign. And in Ezekiel chapter 36, there's a series of promises are stated there, what God is going to do this, God is going to do that. And yet we also read these words, I will yet for this be inquired of by the house of Israel to do it for them. So God promises, uh, or, or God performs what he promises to do but only when he is inquired of, inquired of. You must ask, because that's the means that he has chosen to bring about the realization of the promise. Now let's apply that a little bit. God promises should animate you to pray, as he did Elijah. God wants you to humbly claim his promise. That's what this prophet did. So bring your request to the throne of grace. Come boldly and humbly, but come. Because Jesus Christ loves to answer prayer. And Jesus commands you to come. And be assured that if Jesus commands you to come, he'll command the answers to your prayers. It's an old statement by Augustine who said, 
command what you will and will what you command. If God has promised you things like food, shelter, clothing, housing, fellowship uh, in the body of Christ and other things like this, those are things that you can bring before God in your prayers. But even more so, notice that Elijah's prayer was definite. When you pray, make sure your prayers are specific. This prophet was zeroed in upon one thing, rain. One of the commentators wrote this, the mighty man of God seemed never to have more than one arrow in his quiver at a time. It's important for us to pray specifically for things. Interestingly, in Psalm 5, in the third verse, says that very thing. The English translation is, in the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you and look up. But in the Hebrew language, it's more definite than that. The Hebrew language says in Psalm 5, verse 3, I lay my request to set in order an arrow in the bow. An arrow in the bow. Take careful aim so that your, that your one arrow hits the mark. These are the things that God wants to hear when you pray specifically for things. And make sure that you do hit the target. Stop wasting, stop wasting time with uh, uh, glittering generalities, with, 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 uh, with broad prayers that hit nothing. Now, of course, I'm not trying to say that gener all, all generalities are unlawful. But, I, but I, I do believe it's important that we, we pray specifically for things, for definite things. Now, Elijah claimed the answer when he saw the teeny cloud. He grabbed it and he claimed it. From a small cloud came a big rain. And he had the promise that it would rain. Our most confident prayers are prayers that rest upon the divine promise like praying for food and the shelter and the clothing and the housing. Jesus himself said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things, food, shelter, and the clothing, and the housing, will be added unto you. There, there you have it. It's in print. It's written down. That can be claimed in humility. But Elijah's prayer was also fervent. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. I like to say that it's not the length of your prayers that's all that important, but it is the weight of your prayers. Your prayers should be freighted with love, with humility, with contrition, and tenderness, passion. God is not looking for a marathon prayer of 26 miles, 385 yards. He's looking for a quality sprint. Sometimes we call these ejaculatory prayers like the short prayers of Nehemiah. Now what is fervent prayer? It's when there is this intensity of spirit, this urgency in your praying. Or to, or, or, or to use a, a burning Yule log as an example, when there's white heat. That's why in the Bible you have words like seeking and knocking and crying out and even groaning in prayer. One groan, as somebody said, is better than all the Hail Marys of the formalist. In fact, it's better that, uh, than mouth, uh, mouthing the Lord's Prayer if your heart is really not in the Lord's Prayer when you pray it. We like to say up in Sacramento, and maybe it's said here as well, so forgive me if you say the same thing, God expects us to pray our prayers, not to say our prayers. Now there's a fairly... Uh, well known at one time, anyway, hearsay story about the Orthodox Presbyterian missionary Harvey Kahn, who I believe died around 1996 while serving in Korea. There was a Christian in Korea who sought his counsel because uh, this man didn't think that his prayers were getting through to God. Well, Harvey Kahn had a wonderfully refreshing sense of humor. And he said to the man, he said, well, maybe you need to turn up the decibel level. Pray louder. 
And then the conversation, I guess, sort of petered out after that. Well, here's what happened. A few days later, the man approached Harvey Kahn and thanked him heartily for his advice. He said now he had many answers to his prayers. His prayer life was transformed. Harvey Kahn was obviously surprised that his jest was taken so seriously. Well, here's what I think happened. The man began to pray with less protocol and more unction. He poured out his soul to God, digging deep within himself. He wasn't tossing up a prayer like he would toss up a basketball and hope that it would go through the hoop, but he was praying his prayers. He didn't raise his voice because God was sleeping or because God was slumbering. Rather, his prayers previously were anemic, tired, wooden, and almost routine. So God isn't, or isn't reached when our prayers are formal and routine and heartless. There's an old line from Shakespeare's Hamlet when the king says, in frustration, he says, my words fly up, but my thoughts remain, remain below. Words without thoughts never to heaven go. One of Herman Melville's great lines in Moby Dick, and I use this often, describing the mariner, is this. He uttered a, a prayer so devout, it was as if he was praying from the bottom of the sea, the bottom of the ocean. So how did how do mariners escape shipwreck? When did they escape the drowning? In Psalm 107, when you have the mariner psalm there, it says that then they, they, they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of all their distress, distresses. Very famous expression again from Shakespeare in The Tempest is when the mariners, realizing that there was nothing they could do in the midst of the storm, cried out, all is lost, to prayers to prayers, all is lost. Have you ever felt like that? All is lost, to prayers to prayers. Some situation that you're in, which is difficult, which is excruciatingly painful for you, you're hemorrhaging on the inside, you're weeping, as a matter of fact. All is lost, to prayers to prayers, all is lost. That's when the Lord particularly answers our prayers. Well, Elijah's prayer was also vigilant. Notice he commands his servant to look out to the sea. He says, go up now, look out towards the sea, in verse 43. This teaches us that when you pray, that you're, you're to expect the Lord to answer. He never would have looked out to see if, never would have issued that command if he hadn't expected it to rain. The Lord wants us to expect great things. The motto of the, of the missionary William Carey, remember, was expect great things from God, pray for great things from God, and do great things for God. Don't make a prayer and then forget it. When you pray, expect your covenant-keeping God to answer your prayers, to answer. And don't be like uh, the family of stage actress Helen Hayes is sometimes called the queen of, of the stage, I should say the late Helen Hayes, who quite out of character one year decided that she would roast her first turkey for Thanksgiving and prepare all the other trimmings as well. She'd never done that before, so her husband and members of her family were alarmed, spooked a little bit, feared the worst. So they all agreed that if her turkey dinner was a disaster, they would they'd make a reservation set of, uh, just in case, at a restaurant, which they often frequented. So when the table was set and all were seated, Helen Hayes retreated, re retreated to the kitchen to fetch the turkey dinner. But when she returned into the dining room, she discovered that both her husband and the children were dressed in traveling clothes, ready to drive to the chosen restaurant because they anticipated a disaster. A scorpion instead of an egg, rocks instead of bread. The Lord does not want us to approach prayer that way. 
He wants us to approach prayer with the words of the psalmist. Psalm 130, I wait for the Lord, my soul does wait, and in his word do I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than they that wait for the morning. I say more than they that wait for the morning. That's the way that all of us should pray. God wants you alert for answers. Expect the sun to rise in the morning. You're to have great expectations. In fact, Elijah was so certain that it was going to rain, notice here, he heard the rain even before it rained. Verse 41, he said, go up and eat and drink for there is the sound of abundance of rain. He had already heard the abundance of rain. So if you really believe God, you'll hear the abundance before it actually rains because you are 100% assured that the Lord will answer your prayer. It may be yes, it may be no, it may be wait, or uh, the, uh, the yes answer may be tweaked in a different way that you didn't expect, but your prayer will be answered. As John tells us in 1 John 5, and if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. Now, the thing that's most striking about this time is that Elijah's prayer was also persevering. Now, here's something most interesting. God wants effectual prayer from you and me, but he also wants us to persevere in our prayers. This is called importunity. Jesus said, so ought men always to pray and not to faint. You may not receive an immediate answer. Why is that? Because God's timetable is not your uh, timetable, and your timetable is not his. You may be in a hurry, but God is, may not be in a hurry. Remember, God isn't a bellhop or a porter or a busboy at the Hyatt who carries our luggage at our own beck and call. God is sovereign. He does things his way according to his own time. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. He has made everything beautiful in his time, says Solomon. That's why it may seem that God is a tortoise, ruling at a, sn a, a snail's pace, biding his time, at ease on his throne. Well, God wants you to know that he is on the throne, not us. Certainly, your prayers, your prayers and my prayers do not govern the universe. Yet God does want you to pray. He commands your humble request. Elijah was floored, and his face was, uh, was between his knees here. But notice this as well. Factual prayer doesn't have to last for days or for months or for years. Elijah's prayer took only hours at the most. Now, focus on this. His praying... Um, persevered even when there was nothing. There is nothing. The servant goes up to the top of the mountain and he comes back and he reports, there is nothing. Now the scripture doesn't say so, but it's likely that Elijah continued to pray and each time he ordered his servant to hike up to the mountain and scout out the skies, the same word was brought, brought back. There is nothing. There was nothing in the sky. The sky was azure blue. There was no hint of rain, not even a distant cloud. And this is so true of God's ways. We pour out our souls to God in prayer, and there is nothing. We continue to pray and pray and pray, and still the same answer, nothing, nothing, nothing. Here less... No less than six or seven times, Elijah commands his servant to study the sky, and he brings back the same weather report. Now, is there really nothing? Is that really what's happening here? Well, no, there's such a thing as what some theologians call, and this gets short shrift, the silence of God. Because God's silence is 
God's silence. His silence is meaningful. For example, God's silence may mean that God is being patient or that God is sovereign or that God is wise. So often we make unwise demands of God in our prayers. Just remember the request that was made for Jesus to heal Lazarus after he'd been dead for four days, you remember? But his response was to wait for two days. You see, that's the silence of God. God's silence is always golden. God is patient. God is waiting to be gracious. There's many, many reasons for the silence of God, but it has meaning. That's the point. We never say of God's silence that it is nothing because God is everything. So when you pray and there's silence, you have two choices. You can throw in the towel, give up, and if you do this, this usually shows that your prayers are riddled with unbelief, that you don't really believe that God is there to answer your prayer. Scripture teaches that God is found when you diligently seek him. Persevering proves your faith to be true. Fainting proves that your faith is, a delu is delusional. When you knock on the door, you expect God to be home. And God is always home. Prayer is pictured in the scriptures as knocking, asking, seeking. And if you leave off, this reveals unbelief. But secondly, perseverance shows that you really do believe God and his promises. You're not discouraged by God's delays because God's delays are always golden. You know that God is waiting to be gracious to you. Martin Luther said that believing prayer isn't so much our overcoming God's uh, reluctance, but rather laying hold upon his willingness to answer our prayers. And if you're clinging to a promise, then wait for the Lord to answer. If you have no specific promise, then cast yourself into God's hands and pray, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, his prayer was persevering even with six or seven nothings. Now, if that's true of Elijah, who had a rain promise, how much more so is that true of us? But the seventh time, the servant re makes this report. He says, Behold, there arises a little cloud out of the sea, like a man's hand. And this is also instructive for us. Often you don't have a full answer to your prayers. A little answer, you have a little answer. God often answers your prayers gradually. He'll answer your prayer little by little by little. Not all at once. It's like the blind man who Jesus healed. But not all at once. Remember he was healed. But at first he saw only men that looked like trees. And then his vision became clearer and clearer and clearer until he finally saw a little here and a little there. First there's the blade, then the corn, and then finally the full head of corn. So Elijah's prayer was heard. He tells Ahab to go down before the rain stops. Ahab actually obeys the prophet here. Amazing. Arthur Pink tells how civil rulers are often more prone to accept our temporal advice than they are our spiritual advice. You remember when Paul was on the ship, the 276 sailors in the midst of a shipwreck, a fierce storm. Paul had booked that ship, remember, to Rome, if I can put, put it that way. He was actually booked. He was under arrest. But you remember the, the fierce storm there. But none of those 276 sailors give any indication of believing the gospel. And yet they were willing to take his advice about you know, lowering the, the um, different uh, sailing vessels into the water, and so on and so forth. Temporal advice. So Ahab does not doubt the rain, even after three years of famine. His heart was steely, he was convinced, but he was not converted. He accepted the weather report, 
but he didn't accept the forecast that he was going to hell unless he repented of his sins. So the sky was blackened with windy storm clouds. There was a heavy rain, torrential downpours, probably flash floods, and Ahab escapes the flood and chariots himself to Jezreel. And notice, he doesn't so much as say thank you to God or to Elijah. So in conclusion, three uh, closing applications. First, if you think that Elijah was Superman, you would be mistaken because his nerve system was not bionic. He was made of the same stuff as all of us here in this room today, dust and ashes. And James tells us that Elijah's spiritual DNA was the same as well. He says he was a man of like nature or like passions as we are. So just as Elijah prayed fervently and was heard, you too. There's absolutely no difference. This should encourage you to pray vigorously when you pray. And then let's remember this. The Lord God of Elijah lives today. It's not just this is what happened to Elijah back then, but the same God exists for us today as well. Remember, Elijah's name means the Lord is my God. And when the people's hearts turned back, they cried out, the Lord, he is God, present tense. If the Lord is your God, then God would expect us to be Elijah-like, trusting in the same God. Jesus himself, when he was dying on the cross for our sins, cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Many thought that he was praying to Elijah, but he was actually praying to Elijah's God, the living God, his Father in heaven. You too. So this means that the Lord God of Elijah lives for you today, even now. And so this should put energy into your prayers. Of course, God did this to preserve his people. The nation Israel and Judah must not be wiped out by the famine. The rains must come. If they didn't come, the nation would cease to exist. Let's remember one crucial thing here. The reason why God gave the rain is because he had entered into a covenant with Israel for the sake of David, remember, David's line. If David's line disappeared, was exterminated by drought, by famine, by pestilence, or by whatever, then the promise of the Messiah would fall to the ground and Jesus Christ would not have come to save us from our sins. Now, why does God answer Elijah's prayer then? Is it only because Elijah was godly, because he loved the Lord? And why the hiatus between the announcement that God would send the rain and the actual rain? Well, the first verse of chapter 18 describes God sending the rain, but the rain doesn't fall until many verses later, and only after Elijah prays seven times. Why is this? Well, the reason is because the people of Israel repented on Mount Carmel and there were 450 false prophets of Baal that were killed by Elijah. God turned their hearts to himself. And Elijah had preached, if the Lord be God, follow him. The Baal be God, then follow him. And when the fire descended on the sacrifice, the people cried out, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. So, Here's the reason why it took such a long time. The people needed to repent and turn to God. If they didn't do that, there would be no rain. Remember, repentance is an inward turning of the heart to God, trusting in the Lord for salvation. Your pet sins, which you once cherished and loved, you now despise as snakes. If there's no rain, then it's because we haven't repented. So there's no rain unless you confess, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. So we can't apply what James says about God's answering our prayers unless we first of all forsake our sins and turn to Christ. 
What is saving faith in Christ? Well, it is many things, but at the very least, it is a hearty coming to Christ for salvation. And when we do that with broken and contrite hearts, the Lord will not turn us away, but will receive us heartily and willingly. Amen.